West Virginia has spent a lot of money over the years on such things as trade missions. That's basically sending politicians overseas to see what they can set up. I'm Dan Ringer. We'll talk about West Virginia's place in the world right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. The Law Works is made possible by the generous support of the West Virginia State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system. No one is or can be self-sufficient anymore. Everyone depends on everyone else. Even nations depend on other nations. My guest is West Virginia University College of Law Professor Gregory Bowman. Greg, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me here. When I was a kid, I used to wonder about my place in the family, and then I worried about uh, my family's place in the community, and then I worried about the community's place in the county, then the county's place in the state, and as I get older now, I'm worried about West Virginia's place in the world. And where are we? Well, I think the state's in transition, and I think there are enormous opportunities that the state has. At the same time, it has challenges. I think, I think sometimes we tend to focus on the problems and the challenges and not enough on the opportunities. What kind of opportunities does a state like West Virginia have? We are regarded generally and, and pretty much always have been as a less well endowed state, uh, a poor state. Where do our opportunities lie? Well, we are partly a less well endowed state because we've had less of a road infrastructure and we've had less interaction with other states. We have a smaller economy. I, I think there are opportunities to grow that. I think there are opportunities to have, say, a larger tourism industry in the state. I think there are opportunities to have more businesses in the state. And I think there are opportunities to send West Virginians out in a more visible way. Uh, the state has been, in some respects, isolated culturally, and I think in terms of its, its trade and its, its economic base. So I, I think right now, with, um, with the growth of, say, online commerce and uh, telecommuting and trade and services, I think there are, and, and also in, in other more traditional energies like energy, uh, um, industries like energy, I think there are a lot of opportunities for the state. Well, I know some years ago, the first time I became aware of uh, what we refer to as trade missions, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, then Governor Rockefeller mm -hmm. leaving West Virginia to go to Japan and other Asian China, countries, right. China. Right. He, he was by education an Asian scholar yes. of some note. Yes. So he was comfortable in that. And the general reaction, as I saw it at the time he was doing this, was people were saying, why is he doing that? What's he up to? What, what is to come of this? Mm -hmm. What are such trips all about? About establishing new relationships with businesses and other governments to see if there are the possibilities for uh, greater industrial cooperation. Say, let's say, a, let's say a business from, pick your country, China, Japan, Korea, Belgium, wants to establish a U.S. operation. Where should they go? Where should they come to? You know, can, what's the benefit of coming to West Virginia for them? And West Virginia is, is despite its, its hilly geography, uh, I think it's actually in a pretty geographically advantaged position, right? It's, it's close to the East Coast. It's close to the major metropolitan markets, New York and above, and it's close to the South. So if you don't go and you don't say, we're interested, why don't you come visit? Let's get to know each other. That stuff never happens. Well, and people rely on reputation and history. That's right. And it's, it's kind of ironic. At one time, West Virginia was truly isolated, even though it was physically in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. If you look at a topographical map, you've got mountains, you've got impassable rivers. Yes, the, the Ohio River along the western boundary was impassable. There weren't bridges there. There was no major highway connections that you could get across. Uh, 
if you went to the south, there were more mountains mm -hmm. and more impoverished states. Mm -hmm. So the only, only route we had was much like the settlers coming to settle here. You went north and then you went east and west through Pennsylvania and Ohio to get places. But we now are, we don't have to do that anymore. We are only in the past 30 some years truly connected by uh, four lane interstate to DC from door to door and from north to south with I-79. Well, not too long ago, it was a day trip to go from Morgantown or Wheeling mm -hmm. points north to the state capital in Charleston. That's right. Now, two or three hours and you're there and you come back, it's all, it's just one business day mm -hmm. and you've tended to your matters while you were down there. Mm -hmm. West Virginia has, it seems, little to export, at least by reputation. Is that a correct perception? Uh, we have an enormous amount to export in terms of energy. And a lot of the coal produced in West Virginia and a lot of the potential gas produced in West Virginia is and will be exported. It's one of our largest exports right now. In fact, in the past three years, it surged. What do we get back for that? Money. I mean, it's an economic activity. But the gas is owned by people in other places. The coal is owned by That's people in other places. true. But if we are a unified uh, economy, the United States economy, I mean, you know, the West Virginia is part and parcel of the U.S. economy. You're going to have that kind of ownership. You're going to have that kind of overlap. But what does it do? I mean, can you, can you man a rig from Mississippi? No, there have to be people there. It creates jobs. It creates income. That in turn, create, that in turn creates other jobs in West Virginia. So there, there's, a, there's a bit of a multiplier effect. If you have no economic opportunity, you have no tax base. If you have no tax base, you have no money, you have no good schools, you have no infrastructure, you have no opportunity, and you remain isolated. Well, and it is said that for every dollar that you pay in wages mm -hmm. in an economy, is particularly in the local economy, that dollar rolls over three or four times within the economy. Which is one of the reasons that the 2008 financial crisis was so hard hitting, because it put people out of work that you know, those people then did not spend, and that had a ripple effect throughout the economy. Well, we've seen some development in, well, in particularly in foreign trade. Coal's being sold out of state. There's a Toyota plant uh, near Point Pleasant. Uh, people would think of uh, Toyotas as Japanese cars. They are, but we're making substantial portions of They're them. They're U.S. origin right here. cars for U.S. international trade law purposes. And General Motors, which we thought of as the biggest American car manufacturers, frankly, they're making most of their cars right now in Canada. And they're going to have other overseas operations uh, in the future bigger than they've had in the past. That's right. Well, how, how does the little kid growing up in Elkins or maybe down in Lincoln County or points around, how does that kid posture himself to participate in all this? I think that what needs to happen well, several things need to happen. First of all, I think our educational system needs to focus on broad horizons. You know, I, I, I grew up in West Virginia. I went to undergraduate at WVU, and then I, I left, and I'm back, and I'm back voluntarily. So what we need to do as a state for those, for those kids right now is we need to give them the tools uh, that they need to succeed, and if they stay, they stay by choice, and if they leave, they can go do great things. Uh, we need, we need to, to launch our children. I know that, that sounds kind of cheesy to help them achieve their dreams, but I, I don't think that West Virginia gets better by, by having people stay by default because of narrow horizons. I, I think that, that we, we need to be outward looking, and I, and I think we do that to an extent, but I think we need to really consciously focus even more on doing that now, than we are now. I, mean, I, I, have, I, have, I have grade school kids right now, and what they're exposed to in the public education system right now is far and beyond what, what I was. So we need, to, um, we need to expose them to cultural differences. We need to train them about the world. We need to give them a skill set that is an adaptable skill set for the modern economy. You know, the modern economy is, is not a, a heavy industry economy. Uh, it, is, it is not a, a heavy manufacturing economy. It's light manufacturing and services, right? So we, we, need to give, we need to give people those skills. And if we're retraining people right now, you know, in middle age or older age, we need to try and get them those skills as well. 
How do we do that? You talk about having grade school children. I have children who are in their 20s now. And what they saw in school, where they went to school, was exciting. They had an opportunity to study languages that most people did not have an opportunity to study. Mm -hmm. At least their parents and their grandparents did not have a chance to study. Mm -hmm. They have more opportunity to study mathematics and the sciences. Mm -hmm. They have more opportunities with regard to studying social studies. And there are technical education schools now mm -hmm. that weren't there just a few years ago. Right. In some places. Right. If you go into rural West Virginia, the educational system too often looks very much like the educational system did 30, 40, 50 That's years right. ago. That's exactly right. We're talking about West Virginia's role in international commerce. My guest is West Virginia University College of Law Professor Gregory Bowman. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. I just, just said we're talking about West Virginia's role in inter international commerce, and really that's not what we're talking about. That's where we want to go. It's yeah. part of it. Yeah. But how, how do we get the kids ready? I can, I can give you an example from my own history, and that was I was an educational gadfly. I studied all kinds of things. I studied mm -hmm. sciences. I studied business. Ultimately, I studied law because every time I saw a new field or a different field and I was interested in it, I decided to go study it. But it's hard to get that kind of an opportunity. I grew up in a town with a, a major university in it. Mm -hmm. I went into military service that highly valued education and encouraged mm -hmm. people to do that. Right. And I grew up in a country where if you served in the military, they would pay for a substantial part, if not all, of your right. college education. Right. So what do we tell our kids growing up in the mountains and in the hollows with a uh, high school that has 400 students in it. How do we encourage them to get out into the world? How do we expose them to the world so that they're interested in and of their own accord is one, is one of the ways to But it pretty much has to be voluntary, it, yes. That's one way to rephrase the question because you can only do so much spoon feeding. I and mean, that's particularly true at the adult education level where I teach. But even at the, at the primary educational level, it, it's a question of how do you get people engaged and interested and excited. And you expose them at an early age. You, know, you you offer uh, classes in Chinese, and it may not be you know more than one day a week. You offer social studies with uh, opportunities, perhaps, to travel to Washington D.C. to go to the museums. You even offer. Uh, my daughter was recently offered the opportunity to um, uh, go on an international exchange. Now, might be too young for that, but you know when you're 12, to go abroad with a group, the chaperoned. Depends on where you're going. Canada? Canada's not that big of it. <laughs> but it's different enough, right? Broadening horizons, or even just doing so domestically. Get, get, get them exposed. Get them to see that there's a, there's, there's a broader world out there, and then let the rest take care of itself. And some people might say, that's great. I understand things are done differently there. I want to stay here. That's fine. That's good. That's by choice. But I had no idea that's by default. And those, some of those people may have made a different life choice and may have been able to contribute to society in a much better way than they were able to because they didn't know. Well, the world is literally at your doorstep now and it's pounding on the door. When a, a student comes out of school, uh, they may be able to find a job in their hometown. Maybe. They may have to move some distance, maybe a great distance to find a job. Sure but they also have to be conversant with the world because those folks are coming here. And that's one of the skills we need to teach. And that's a great, that's a great point, Dan, because exposing people to the world includes bringing the world here, right? And bringing in possibly teachers, bringing in possibly students, doing a mini exchange. There, there are people at the law school level, which is above where we're talking about right now, but people who cannot afford, have neither the time, nor the family circumstances, nor the money to study abroad, which is more expensive than just staying home and going to law school. But what if the students come in, which the law school does? That broadens our community, that broadens horizons, that provides for exposure. Well, you, you get ideas from, from students coming here, whether it's in the law school or wherever it is, they bring ideas that are essential to our understanding of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I had an encounter with a uh, a Chinese doctoral level graduate student, a mining engineer, mm -hmm. some years ago. 
And we were talking about mining policies, and I asked of him, because at the time it was a real problem in West Virginia, what do you do about surface subsidence? And he said, we don't worry about that. Sure. I said, we don't worry about it. Houses fall into the crater. It's a real problem here. How do you organize so that you don't have to worry about that? And he said, we don't. The government owns the surface. Right. It's not a problem. Right. If your house falls down, you move to another house. Right. And it had never occurred to me. And it is a problem, but it's a problem they choose not to address. That's right. They, it's it's not a problem you for don't the government. The land, but so you pay it, for that. That's right. It's not a problem for the government. We've decided not to worry about it. End of story. But the, I realized at that point, we're going to compete with these guys mm -hmm. in getting coal out of the ground cheaply, mm -hmm. and they don't worry about what happens upstairs. Right. They just take the coal. Here we do. We're going to have conflicts, and, and of course we do. There's yeah. There's an interesting, that actually raises a really interesting point about international trade. We, we like to think that, that businesses, and businesses often assume that they would prefer a freer market. But sometimes having a level playing field with everybody held to a higher standard is preferable. It, it, talk, to, talk to many business people and they will say, we can't afford to pe compete on price, but they should be doing this too. You know, that happened with US law pertaining to bribery of foreign officials, U.S. law said, can't bribe foreign officials to get business. And other nations said, oh, we're not going to do that. We're going we're to bribe. And eventually, they decided it was too expensive, and now they do it too, and it reduced bribery worldwide. Well, the same could be true with mining, with environmental impact. I mean, you'll have a marginal, and sometimes significantly marginal impact on profit, right? I'm not, suggest, I'm not trying to, to minimize the impact of regulations just in and of themselves, but it levels the playing field. And so a lot of what international trade law and international trade regulation tries to do is level that playing field with respect to intellectual property protection, with respect to workers' rights, with respect to unemployment, with respect to environmental impact. And that's one of the biggest impacts that international trade regulation can make. We're talking about West Virginia's role in international commerce. My guest is West Virginia University College of Law Professor Gregory Bowman. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. I saw a, a report on 60 Minutes some years ago about battery recycling. Mm -hmm. We don't do it in this country anymore. No. We don't smelt lead much in this country anymore. We don't recycle much. But with regard to Mexico, they would send the batteries to Mexico. Mm -hmm. They would recycle them and then send them back to us. Mm -hmm. They could do that because their environmental protections were essentially non-existent, at least for that industry. Mm -hmm. Excess uh, sulfuric acid, uh, right. lead pieces were just discharged into the next stream. They ran out of town insofar right. as they did, and right. they continued to manufacture. Right. And I've heard many business people say, well, if we could work by their standards, we could do that too, mm -hmm. but we can't. And in that instance, it didn't seem like their government was much interested in changing those standards because, like most people, they were addicted to money, and they were making lots of it from allowing that kind of thing to happen. Right. If I'm doing something in, in West Virginia, making potholders or right. folk art or whatever it may be, and I set up my business, you mentioned uh, electronic or online commerce, mm -hmm. I can just as easily sell something to someone in West Virginia, Georgia, California, or Timbuktu. Right. How do I know how to sell things like that? Where do I go to get help? One of the places you can go as a small business is the Small Business Administration of the uh, U.S. federal government, which provides assistance to small businesses in terms of setting up their operations, providing for general business advice uh, and general legal advice. Uh, another place to go would be to the West Virginia government. There's an office, an international trade development office. And we'll uh, have which, a link for that on yes. our website page at thelawworks.org. And the other place that, that that any business thinking of doing anything pertaining to international trade uh, should go, and it sounds like a plug, but it's not, is if you're going to do anything significant, you need to talk to a lawyer. Well, Even plug, if it's just to, to, to generally vet it. Plugs are okay, yeah. <laughs> because we, this, one of the purposes of this program is <laughs> well, to help under, uh, people understand when they need to go to see a lawyer. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk to a lawyer in international trade. Okay. How many of them are there in West Virginia? There will be more. There are not that many yet. It's it's a it's an industry that tends to be focused in New York and Washington D.C. 
In fact, that's one of the reasons why you're here. I used to practice in D.C. That's right. Well, and so. uh, you have a, a bit of a background in international trade. A bit of a background <laughs> in international trade, that's right. So uh, it, it seems like legal education, uh, for example, is a moving target. It is, and it should be, right? Any, any, any school that's not trying to improve is falling behind. It's a, it's a moving target. Education's a moving target. Business is a moving target, right? You, you, can't, you can't have your business stay here and do this for the next 50 years. You have to constantly be improving as any good business person knows. Well, when should a person start to worry about whether they need to inter understand international trade? You're going into business and I, I want to know now what to worry about. And I can, I can tell you as a practical matter, it's hard enough mm -hmm. starting a business in West Virginia and doing business in Pennsylvania or Ohio. Right, right. The point at which you should worry, and again, what's the saying, all generalizations are bad. Generally. <laughs> but but you, don't, you don't start a business by looking for ways you can spend your money. Uh, you, you look for ways to spend your money effectively on what the immediate need is. The, um, I wouldn't advise any business starting just to go out and, 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 and try and vet that. But if, you, if a significant part of your business or a not insignificant part of your business is going to be in trade, you need to ask certain questions. You need to ask, you know, what am I doing? Where is what I'm doing going, be it a service, be it a good, be it technology? With whom am I doing business? Because somebody in Belgium or the United Kingdom may or may not be a problematic actor. Um, uh, what is it going to be used for? And where is it going to end up? What's its ultimate destination? Not where you're shipping it, but where you know or have reason to know it's going to go. Most, most U.S. trade laws in terms of if you're doing something that is going outbound as opposed to buying inbound, focus on Who's going to get it, and what are they going to do with it? And, and you need to vet those things very carefully because it's, it's easy to get caught unawares. Oh, I'm a good company. I'd never do that. I just sell coriander or, or whatever you sell. But if it ends up in Iran, is that a problem? If you sell pencils to where? Pencils to Pakistan for the alliteration. Pencils to Pakistan for use in calculations uh, that are being used or, or for use in, uh, by terrorists taking notes. That's a problem. So the pencil company has to, has to worry about it. The food company has to worry about it. The, 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 um, the parts company has to worry about it. And on the inbound side, you need to make sure that you've got a secure supply chain set up. So very quickly, it does get complicated. And that's why you, you want to talk to a knowledgeable trade lawyer who can say in a, in a cost-effective way, this is what you need to worry about. And this is what I advise you to do. And then, and then do that. And set up a system, set up a process for vetting your inbound orders or vetting your outbound orders. It seems that there are just tremendous opportunities uh, available for being involved in international trade, even if you're just doing something very sim simple, oh, yeah. assembling novelty items with a clockwork mechanism in it. You, you may very well find that the only source for those clockwork mechanisms is, is China or Hong Kong or, or someplace. Uh, I have a bit of a hobby regarding wristwatches. Mm -hmm. It's just astounding when you look at where the sub-assemblies come from. You get movements almost exclusively from Asia now. Mm -hmm. Swiss watch movements aren't made in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. They may be assembled in part, but even the Swiss laws say you just have to have value added greater than the sum of the it's, parts or something. It, it, Italian ties are not Italian. That's right. German cars are not German. And in each case, you have to understand what the law is of obtaining your part, right. assembling it, and then getting it out of the country. And for example, if you're buying a computer, I mean, com your computer is going to have parts from, what, 20 different countries in it. But you can rely on, 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 on the IBM or the Apple to have vetted their source and supply. So you buy it domestically and that's fine. You have to know when to ask the questions and worry and when not to. And again, it's, it's not just goods, uh, it's, it's, it's services as well. And it's lawyers, right? Even if you're just practicing law in, pick your county in West Virginia and you're doing DUI cases, what if one of your clients, or what if one of, what if one of your clients is, is foreign national? You need to know what questions to ask and where to turn. You don't have to be an expert. Well, you that, that has become, Major, of major concern to lawyers, uh, especially when you're talking about criminal violations, if your client is not an American citizen, 
there is much more to be concerned about whether he's going to be acquitted or spend six months in jail or 60 years in jail. What happens to him next? That's right. That, are, there, are there questions of deportation? What do, you de what do you need to do now to procedurally protect his or her substantive rights? Are there treaties that apply? And there are cases in which treaties have applied and not, the issue has not been raised in time and defenses have been foregone. Waved, yeah. yeah, waved. Well, the world is at your door and knocking and if you have children, let them answer the door. <laughs> Give them some opportunities. Greg Bowman, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Dan. Thank you also for joining us on behalf of the Law Works. I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. If you have a legal problem and want to know if you need a lawyer, you can discuss your problem with a lawyer by calling 1-800-642-3617 Tuesday evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. That's 1-800-642-3617. On the Law Works webpage at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works program topics and additional information about this show's topic. If you would like to recommend this program to a friend, you'll find a video of the program at the Law Works website. You'll also find free video and podcasts of previous programs on YouTube and iTunes. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future program, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a free copy of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the West Virginia State Bar, the Mountain State Bar, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by the generous support of the West Virginia State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia, the West Virginia Bar Foundation the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.